So testosterone is one of the most fundamental hormones involved in the development of male sex characteristics during puberty, and is thought to increase by up to 30-fold during this time span. However, there is also a notable drop in a protein known as sex hormone binding globulin during this time span of up to four-fold, which is also thought to lead to this masculization uh, that happens during this time span. Now, the reason for this, as the name implies, is that sex hormone binding globulin, or SHB, BG for short, binds to sex hormones and is thought to render them inactive. And so when SHBG levels drop during puberty, it's thought to lead to an increase in the availability of androgens that are free to act on androgen receptors and uh, lead to the masculinization that occurs during puberty. Now, this has obvious implications for adolescents that are going through puberty. However, it also has implications for men that are just simply trying to optimize their testosterone levels. If SHBG does in fact inhibit the bioavailability of testosterone, it's therefore safe to assume that men would typically want to lower their SHBG levels. However, the role of SHBG appears to be far more complex than this. Now, when you look at testosterone levels in the body, it is usually characterized in one of two primary ways. You have total testosterone, which is obviously the total amount of measurable testosterone in the bloodstream at any particular time. And then you also have what has been termed free testosterone, which is defined as the amount of your total testosterone that is unbound by one of these two carrier proteins known as albumin and SHBG. Now, at any given moment, roughly 98% of your total testosterone can be bound by one of these two proteins, which means that only 2% of your total testosterone is typically considered free and unhindered to act on androgen receptors in the body. It's estimated that roughly 54% of your total testosterone is bound to albumin, whereas 44% is estimated to be bound to SHBG. But the reason that SHBG gets so much more attention than albumin is because SHBG has a much higher binding affinity for the sex hormones than albumin does, as evidenced by the fact that roughly 99% of blood albumin sex hormone docking sites are actually open. And this means that even large fluctuations in albumin levels cause very little change to free testosterone levels, whereas SHBG, on the other hand, because of its extremely high binding affinity to um, androgens and estrogens, even small fluctuations in SHBG levels can cause a dramatic increase in free androgens. And on top of this, because albumin is only loosely bound to testosterone, it's largely thought that testosterone bound to albumin can easily disassociate at target tissues in order to actually carry out biological activity. Activity. And is also why testosterone that's bound to albumin, even though it isn't considered to be free testosterone, is considered to be somewhat bioactive. Now, it's also important to point out here that, as the name implies, SHBG does not exclusively bind to testosterone. It binds to several sex steroids in the descending order of DHT, testosterone, androstenediol, estradiol and estrone. Now, SHBG does have a much higher binding affinity for androgens than it does for estrogens. SHBG actually binds to DHT several times more effectively than it does to testosterone, and to testosterone several times more effectively than it does to estrogen, which is why when SHBG levels are high, it can lead to an estrogenic environment, whereas when uh, SHBG levels are low, it typically leads to an androgenic environment in the body. Now, where things get a little interesting is that estrogen and testosterone actually have differing inhibitory and stimulatory actions on SHBG levels. However, before we dive into this, I do want to give a huge shout out to today's video sponsor, Element. Now, a lot of attention has been given to various macronutrients and micronutrients in the nutrition community. However, the most important nutrient for the human body by far is actually water. However, unfortunately, it's impossible to stay hydrated while drinking water without proper electrolyte intake, which is what Element makes so easy. Element is a perfectly proportioned electrolyte mix of sodium, potassium, and magnesium that makes it extremely easy to help meet your electrolyte needs in order to stay optimally hydrated. Now, aside from the science of Element's ability to help keep you hydrated and optimize performance, it also doesn't hurt that it tastes 
absolutely amazing and has absolutely zero sugars or fillers in it. And what's more is that right now, my friends over at Element are currently offering my audience a free sample pack of Element for free with any order. But this deal is only available through the link that's in the description of this video. So make sure to follow the link down below that's in the description of this video or go to drinkelement.com slash nutrition library to snag this offer. Now, what's interesting about the effects of estrogen and testosterone on SHBG is that estrogen appears to stimulate the production of SHBG in the liver, whereas testosterone appears to inhibit the production of, of SHBG in the liver. And this is typically what you usually see in men that are taking exogenous testosterone. They'll typically have higher levels of testosterone and lower levels of SHBG, which tends to further increase their free testosterone. However, in men that are not taking exogenous testosterone, this is actually not what you typically see. When you look at the data specifically in men with hypogonadism that have low testosterone, you typically also see low levels of SHBG in up to 73% of these men. And furthermore, in men specifically with primary hypogonadism caused by obesity, there also appears to be a fairly reliable decrease in SHBG levels along along with a decrease in testosterone. The higher your testosterone is, the higher your SHBG appears to be. And what's even more interesting is that estrogen levels specifically in these men also appear to be slightly elevated, which you would typically um, assume would lead to an increase in SHBG levels. But again, this is just not what you see here, which seems to suggest that testosterone and estrogen are not the primary determining factors in regards to uh, SHBG levels. And on this note, there are a handful of other hormonal pathways that may be of greater importance when it comes to SHBG levels, including IGF-1, insulin levels, and inflammatory cytokines, all of which actually appear to decrease SHBG levels and all of which also appear to increase during instances of obesity. The increase in IGF-1, insulin secretion, as well as inflammatory cytokines that you see in obesity appear to lower SHBG levels. And because obesity increases all of those markers, it might actually offset the effects that testosterone and estrogen have on SHBG levels. But it's also important to note here that this does appear to be unique in regards to hypogonadism that is caused by obesity. In men with age-related secondary hypogonadism that's absent of obesity, there does appear to be a concurrent decrease in total testosterone testosterone and increase in SHBG levels, which all seems to indicate that depending on your metabolic status and the cause of the hypogonadism uh, that's in question, uh, SHBG levels may or may not be elevated. But it also appears to indicate something extremely important, and that is that the primary determining factors of SHBG levels don't appear to be sex hormones per se, but are actually insulin, IGF-1, and inflammatory cytokines and also indicates that one of the most uh, fundamental and proven ways to decrease SHBG levels is actually to become obese. And even on the flip side of this, one of the most uh, proven ways to uh, increase SHBG is to actually um, go on a long-term calorie-restrictive diet. And the biggest question here to ask is, what is the biggest common denominator? And it appears to be that the largest common denominator between all of these is actually insulin levels. Insulin actually appears to be one of the most influential hormones involved in the regulation of SHBG levels. And this is very in line with the clinical data as well. In obesity, insulin secretion is dramatically increased, which appears to lead to a decrease in SHBG levels, whereas in instances of late onset hypogonadism and calorie restriction, there is a decrease in insulin secretion, which appears to lead to an increase in SHBG levels. But what's more is the effects of insulin on SHBG levels don't appear to be exclusive to obesity, calorie restriction, and aging as well. Even in instances of insulin resistance, the overconsumption of sugar, or even in the case of modest short-term weight gain, 
SHBG levels also appear to be suppressed. Now, because neither obesity nor long-term calorie restriction are going to be optimal strategies to leverage in order to augment the levels of SHBG levels, it does lead us to ask the question, what are some other ways to um, augment insulin levels in order to augment SHBG levels? And so it's hard to talk about insulin without talking about carbohydrate intake. Now, because insulin does appear to have such a dramatic impact on SHBG levels, it has been suggested that a low carbohydrate diet may in fact actually increase SHBG levels and therefore decrease bioavailable and free testosterone. And to be honest, this idea may actually have some merit. Low carb diets do appear to lower insulin levels independent of weight loss. And there is at least one study that suggests that a low carbohydrate calorie restricted diet could raise SHBG levels. Though it's hard to say if this is because of the carbohydrate restriction per se or because of the calorie restriction um, that also tends to increase SHBG levels. However, with that being said, it is worth noting that uh, most of the evidence to support the claim that a low carbohydrate diet leads to an increase in SHBG does appear to be anecdotal. Now, this doesn't mean that it's completely invalid. However, it does need to be taken with a slight grain of salt. Salt. It is entirely possible that a low carbohydrate diet may lead to an increase in SHBG levels, either through the inherent restriction in carbohydrates and subsequent um, reductions in insulin levels, or because of the calorie restrictive state that a low carbohydrate diet encourages. And this may be of particular concern to guys that are engaging in extremely high intensity exercise um, multiple times per week. High intensity exercise exercise does put a large demand on the glucose system in your body and uh, the availability of glucose. And so if you are outpacing through exercise, the ab ability of your body to uh, supply glucose for high intensity exercise, there may be a subsequent um, increase in SHBG levels while on a uh, low carbohydrate diet, even if you are consuming enough calories. However, it's also worth uh, pointing pointing out here that carbohydrates are not the only nutrient that have an insulinogenic um, response in the body. Protein also does induce an insulin response. And furthermore, a high protein diet has also been shown to um, be associated with a decrease in SHBG levels. Now, this could be because of the insulin inducing properties of protein, but it could also be related to the effects that protein has on IGF-1. IGF-1 can also reliably reduce SHBG levels and because protein has such a reliable effect on IGF-1, protein may, yes, decrease SHBG by increasing insulin, but it may also decrease SHBG through increasing IGF-1. This means that if you do choose to go on a low carbohydrate diet for whatever reason, that protein intake appears to become extremely important in order to maintain insulin levels as well as to maintain IGF-1 levels, both of which appear to positively augment SHBG levels. Levels. Now, another important thing to note here is that while on a low-carbohydrate diet, gluconeogenesis also increases, which may further increase the demand on protein, which may then also further increase the importance of maintaining proper protein intake while on a low-carbohydrate diet in order to maintain IGF-1 levels and insulin secretion. Now, for those of you that aren't particularly uh, concerned with carbohydrate intake, um, again, one of the easiest ways to maintain insulin levels is to simply consume carbohydrates, especially in uh, proportion to your activity level. As activity levels increase, you may want to um, further increase your carbohydrate intake in order to match your energy output, but you may also want to avoid high fiber and high polyphenol car carbohydrates that have also been shown to increase um, SHBG levels. And so opting for things like white rice, and white potatoes and even white bread for those of you that aren't sensitive to it, as well as uh, uh, sugar and honey and maple syrup um, may be good options to introduce into your diet in order to um, uh, match the carbohydrate needs and the glucose needs that are placed on your body during periods of high intensity exercise. Now, it's also important to note here that high
high blood sugar has also been shown to suppress gonadotropin output, GnRH output, as well as luteinizing hormone um, and testicular function. So I wouldn't go absolutely nuts with increasing carbohydrate intake. However, for the purpose of providing glucose for high intensity exercise, um, matching your um, uh, glucose intake with your exercise output um, may be a good option for those of you that are specifically trying to optimize SHBG levels as well as IGF-1 levels and insulin levels. Now, before we move on to micronutrients, I do think it's also worth noting here very briefly that fat intake also appears to have a um, effect on SHBG levels. Um, a high fat diet does in fact appear to suppress SHBG levels. And so theoretically, if you are um, committed to a low carbohydrate diet, um, theoretically by consuming adequate amounts of protein and adequate amounts of fat, as well as calories, you may be able to maintain lower levels of SHBG. However, for again, guys that are choosing a low carbohydrate diet, if you do not consume enough protein and enough fat and enough calories, this may be what um, ends up causing an increase in SHBG levels, at least in these anecdotal reports. All right, so now that we've talked about proteins, fats, and carbohydrates and their effects on SHBG levels, I do want to very briefly talk about micronutrient intake. And the reason it's going to be brief is because there just simply isn't a ton of research yet. However, what little research does exist does appear to point uh, to the fact that specifically minerals such as zinc, boron, and magnesium, as well as selenium, do in fact appear to decrease SHBG levels, whereas minerals such as iodine and copper appear to increase SHBG levels. Now, there undoubtedly are some other micronutrients that have an influence and an impact on SHBG levels. However, because there is such little evidence on the effects of micronutrients on SHBG, um, as well as a lack of research on SHBG in general, um, it's tough to make any different definitive claims as to the most important micronutrients. Uh, but at this point, it does appear that um, adequate mineral intake does appear to be one of the most influential factors when it comes to maintaining low levels of SHBG. Now, with all of this being said, I do think it's also worth noting here that um, even though there does appear to be some dietary measures that can influence the production of SHBG in the liver, um, the role and the specific role of SHBG isn't exactly exactly clear yet. Yes, SHBG does appear to um, somewhat limit the bioavailability of testosterone in the body. However, it also appears to inhibit the um, metabolism and excretion of testosterone, which may actually be advantageous in some situations. And on top of this, there is an argument to be made that SHBG that's bound to testosterone may have its own receptor, whereby it's actually able to have androgenic action in the body even when bound to SHBG. And on top of that, it's also worth noting that low SHBG levels are not just associated with obesity and diabetes, but also with fatty liver disease, heart disease, and osteoporosis. And so it's not exactly clear yet if low levels of SHBG is actually a biomarker worth pay paying attention to and actually trying to augment intentionally. Low levels of SHBG are actually most often associated with poor health outcomes. And so I say all of this pretty much just as a disclaimer that there's just a lot about SHBG that we really don't know yet, especially in healthy, active males. It's not exactly clear whether you want lower levels of SHBG or higher levels of SHBG. Um, and it's really not clear yet if it's of practical concern in men that are healthy and aren't symptomatic. But also make sure to check out the link down below for a free sample pack of Element with any purchase. If you've ever been interested in uh, trying Element, this is one of the best times to do so. But other than that, guys, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to leave a comment down below and I will see you guys next time.